Welcome back to the playlist on gene expression. So this is, let me get the right brush. This is the playlist on gene expression. Okay. So what we've been focusing on in some of the previous videos is we've been fo focusing on something referred to as the central, the central dogma of molecular biology and biochemistry. And what the central dogma essentially says, and I know I've done this lecture before, is we have this DNA that's contained within the nucleus. And the DNA is the permanent holder of all the genetic information in your cells. And we start with the DNA, and through a process referred to as transcription, which I've labeled as one, we have the capacity to make a molecule, which is a polymer, of nucleotides known as RNA. Okay? And... There are various types of RNA that we're typically concerned with. Some of the more important ones would, of course, be messenger RNA, which we abbreviate mRNA. There's also tRNA, or what we call transfer RNA. And then there's one that often is very much neglected when you get into some of the um, even upper-level biology classes. It's very neglected. It's called rRNA, which just stands for ribosomal RNA. Now, I think in general, when you're in biochemistry and upper-level biology classes, you kind of have a fundamental understanding of mRNA and tRNA. Okay? mRNA is really just the transient carrier of genetic information from the DNA in the nucleus into the cytosol where the ribosomes are. Okay? And it's only transient because eventually the mRNA will be degraded. It's very unstable, so it has a pretty short, short half-life. Okay, the transfer RNA actually physically transports amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, to the ribosome. Okay, but I think most people don't really have an intuitive sense of what ribosomal RNA is. Well, ribos first of all, RNA is used, all three of these are used basically by an enzyme known as the ribosome. Okay, the ribosome for all intents and purposes, is basically a protein synthesis factory. Okay, so we use all three of these types of RNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA, you, and these are used by the ribosome essentially to make our final product of gene expression, which is a protein. So that's our ultimate goal of basically transcribing the DNA into RNA, and then we use these three components to make the protein, and that's a process called translation that's carried out by the ribosome. Now, like we've mentioned in previous videos, there are intermediate processes that we have to do. For example, when I transcribe the DNA into RNA, for example, we had a whole set of videos on mRNA processing. You know, with mRNA, I have to make a 5 prime 7 methyl guanosine cap. I have to splice out the introns and glue the exons together. I have to use an endonuclease to cleave off part of a, a nucleotide sequence at the 3 prime end. And then at the 3 prime end, I have to use an enzyme called polyadenylate polymerase to add a bunch of adenosine monophosphate residues to the 3 prime end. So in mRNA, there's things I have to do. In tRNA, for example, there's some splicing that has to go on. And there's also post-transcriptional modifications you have to do to put in some what they call funny bases, like inosine and so forth. Okay, We'll have a whole video on that eventually. Um, ribosomal RNA, what it essentially is, is it's the catalytic component. It's the catalytic component of the ribosome. So there's some basic information that you have to understand about the ribosome before we proceed. Although the ribosome is an enzyme, the actual catalytic component is ribosomal RNA. Okay, so the ribosome has basically two components for all intents and purposes. Okay, the ribosome has a protein component and it has a ribosomal RNA component. Okay. Here's the interesting thing about the ribosome. Even though it is classified as an enzyme, if you look at the active site of the ribosome, there's actually no protein anywhere near it. Okay, And the active site only contains ribosomal RNA, which means that ribosomal RNA is what's actually doing the catalytic reaction of essentially ligating the amino acids together using the tRNA. Okay. The protein is nowhere near the active site, so the protein really is providing a scaffold off of which 
the rib ribosomal RNA will get its tertiary structure and facilitate the reaction. Okay, so this process that we're talking about is the central dogma of molecular biology, going from DNA to RNA, these three types, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, to protein. But the thing they often leave out is that ribosomal RNA is the catalytic component of the ribosome. And hopefully we're going to get in this mechanism kind of an understanding of how this works. Now, the ribosomal RNA that's part of the ribosome actually has its own name, just like you would see for a protein. Different proteins that are enzymatic have their own names. If you look at the committed step in glycolysis, that's an enzyme. It has the name hexokinase. If you look at the committed step in the TCA cycle, that's an enzyme. It has the name citrate synthase. So ribosomal RNA gets its own name, and its name is something called peptidyl. It's called peptidyl transferase. And when we look at the mechanism, we'll find out why it's called that. Now, one thing I want to be perfectly clear on is this is a little bit different than a normal enzyme besides the fact that it's ribosomal RNA. Here's the thing about peptidyl transferase. Okay, I've already mentioned there's no protein anywhere near the active site. And generally when we look at enzymes that are proteins, you have amino acids that are catalyzing um, different steps in the mechanism. For example, you could have a lysine or a histidine doing Bronsted-Lowry acid base catalysis. You could have a serine or a cysteine acting as a nucleophile. But there are no amino acids near the active site because there's no protein near the active site. Uh, another interesting thing is you, you might say, oh, well, maybe the nitrogenous base of the um, nucleotide residues, maybe they're doing the catalysis. No, that's not the case. There's no adenine, there's no guanine, there's no uracil, there's no cytosine, none of that's doing any catalysis. Basically, what peptidyl transferase is doing is it's not really... It, it technically is catalyzing the reaction because it drastically speeds it up. But really what it's doing is it's providing proper orientation for the reaction to occur. So it's, number one, providing proximity, bringing things close together. But it's not really doing anything directly. It's just providing proper orientation for things to occur. Okay, so having said that, let's actually look at the mechanism of peptidyl transferase. Now... I recommend highly that you have a good understanding of the ribosome structure, okay, i.e. the A site, the P site, and the E site, and how each of, that, of those sites works, okay? And we have a whole video and lecture on the ribosome physiology from a biological perspective. I'm assuming at this point that you already know a little bit about the ribosome mechanism, but this is actually going to be the organic mechanism, okay? So, like I, I said in the previous video, we have an A site, a P site, and an E site. This particular, and I've tried to label them here, this particular tRNA right here, okay, this is the tRNA and the A site. And what I've done is I put the site in the middle of the ribose ring so you can tell. So this tRNA is in the A site. And remember what the A site is, it's called the aminoacyl site. Because what comes into the A site is the aminoacyl tRNA. And I haven't specified what specific residue it is, but suffice it to say, I have this amino acid residue right here. Of course, we know that it's in an ester linkage, an ester linkage to the ribose ring of the three prime adenosine moiety, and then it has a free amine. Okay. Over here, I have this tRNA that's in the P site. Okay. Why is it called the P site? Well, that's the peptidyl site. Okay, the, at the beginning of every ribosomal cycle, at the beginning of every cycle of peptidyl transferase, you always start with a tRNA with the growing peptide chain in the P site. That's how you start every cycle, and only once that occurs can the aminoacyl tRNA come into the A site. Okay, and basically, you know, for example, let's say this peptide, maybe it's 100 amino acids long. Okay, just to give you a sense of that the growing polypeptide chain is attached to the tRNA in the P site. So that means this one over here, this is also 100 amino acids long. Okay, so just to give you an intuitive sense of that. Okay, so basically what's going to happen in this mechanism is, I'll do the mechanistic steps in green. The tRNA in the A site that has this amino acid in an ester linkage, the amine of that amino acid is going to do a nucleophilic attack 
on this particular ester carbon right here. So this ester is going to be attacked. And when the, when the nucleophilic attack occurs, just like in the case of any nucleophilic acyl substitution, you're going to generate what's referred to as a tetrahedral intermediate. Now, what's important to realize is that in the active site of peptidyl transferase, okay, there is a water residue. Okay? The water is used for two purposes. Number one, it's basically used for Bronsted-Lowry acid base um, donor donation and um, accepting and so forth. Okay, it's used as a bronsted lowry acid and base. But also, when you generate this tetrahedral intermediate, notice that this oxyanion now has a negative charge because the oxygen has one extra electron. Okay, from its valence. Okay, the hydrogen here on the water has a partial positive charge, as we would expect. So the partial positive charge on this proton of water actually stabilizes the tetrahedral um, oxyanion intermediate. Okay. Then what's going to happen, as you would expect from any tetrahedral intermediate, let me draw the lone pair here, the tetrahedral intermediate will collapse. And when it does that, it reforms the carbonyl bond. But like in the case of any nucleophilic acyl substitution, you have to have loss of a leaving group. And it turns out that the leaving group is all this business over here. So it's all of this, it's all of this tRNA over here in the P site. So what's going to happen is a series of proton transfers. When you get loss of this ribose ring, you're going to abstract the proton from the water. That's going to abstract the proton from the two prime hydroxyl group. And then what's going to happen is this bond right here, notice I'm drawing it in red so you can see it, this bond, these electrons are going to come out and abstract the proton from the new amide of this amino acid right here. So what I've essentially done is I've created a non-acylated, so right here, this is a non a non-acylated, it's non-acylated because there's no amino acid, so a non-acylated tRNA in the P site. Okay, and notice, notice the following. Remember how I said in the last video when we actually talked about ribosome function that at the, at the end of the cycle before we get to EFGGTP, you should get a free tRNA in the P site. That's what I'm referring to here, this non-acylated tRNA. This is the free, this is the free tRNA that I was talking about. Notice it's non-acylated. The entire acyl chain or the peptide chain has been replaced with a proton as shown right there. And now what you effectively have is the entire growing polypeptide chain plus the extra amino acid denoted as R prime. You know, you'd have the 100 amino acids over here and this extra amino acid right here. All that business is now attached in an ester linkage to the three prime hydroxyl group of the tRNA in the A site. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. That's the mechanism of peptidyl transferase, but we're going to have one more thing to reset the cycle of the ribosome. Keep in mind that in prokaryotic systems, you have this protein called EFGGTP. Okay. The, the, the singular name of this enzyme without the GTP is just EFG, but as we know, it's a G protein, so it binds GTP for its cycle. Okay, um, Prokaryotes use this enzyme, so that means bacteria. Eukaryotes don't use this exact enzyme, but there's one that's homologous. They give it a different name, but it does exactly the same thing. Keep in mind what's going to happen is EFG, GTP, um, it's going to cause translocation of the ribosome. And so remember, whatever was in the P site ends, in the, ends up in the E site. Whatever is in the A site ends up in the P site of the ribosome. So effectively what you do by using this EFG GTPG protein is whatever is in the P site goes into the E site and it dissociates because the E stands for exit. So whatever's in the E site goes away and is free to react with another cycle of amino acyl tRNA synthetase, and you'll get more protein synthesis that way. Whatever was in the A site ends up in the P site. So now you have this, 
this growing polypeptide chain. Now it's 101 amino acids. Remember I started with 100? Well, I added an extra amino acid, so I'm going to kind of combine those into 101. Okay, And now it's in the P site. Now what I've effectively done is reset the cycle of the ribosome. So remember, at the beginning of every cycle of the ribosome, you should have the growing polypeptide chain attached to the tRNA that's in the P site. And notice it's still in an ester linkage to the 3' prime hydroxyl group of that tRNA in the P site. And that right there is the cycle of peptidyl transferase and the ribosome. So hopefully that mechanism makes a little bit of sense. See you in the next video.